There are seven billion of us in the world today, and we're facing some huge problems. But talk doesn't help someone out of poverty. Awareness doesn't reduce pollution, or grow food, or heal the sick. That takes doing. The solutions are here. Great inventions that generate clean energy, that make fresh water, that improve our health. This is the story of what we've been doing. I'm Manoj Bhargav, the founder of Five Hour Energy. Have you seen this little bottle by the cash register? Five hours, that's a weird amount of time. But I can't drink any more than this. I don't have the energy. <laughs> Top 10 Rick Perry excuses. I had a five hour energy drink six hours before the debate. Oh, no. I have this idea for this drink. Within two months, we had it on shelves. And it was growing bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, it became one of the largest consumer products in the world. Five hour energy. Sales got up 12%. Yes. Sold over a billion and a half. 90% of the market share. Just cracked the Forbes billionaire list. But I realized, oh my God, we're making a lot of money here. What do I do with this? <laughs> I'll tell you how we work in our company. Somebody comes to me with a project or something needs to be done, and the first question I ask is, is it useful? How is it useful? Okay. And if it's not useful, it better be entertaining. <laughs> and if it's not useful or entertaining, there's only one other basket left, and that's useless. Five hours is a lot of things for me because it's also the enabler that gives us an opportunity to do things that other people can't do. This was our first building, which is really more five-hour energy. And then uh, we bought this whole thing. Now we have 10 buildings and 25 acres. One of the buildings out of the 10 buildings is an invention shop, which is called Stage Two. My approach to things is, let's do stuff, invent stuff, make a difference in other people's lives. Stage two works in the area of water, power, health. Our goal is very simple, to deliver innovations which can directly impact humanity. And the only way to do that is to actually go fund it. Our view is, if you invent stuff that can be used long-term, it's probably the most fundamental change you can make. We've put an infrastructure together so that great inventions help the poorer half of the world make their lives better. That's what we define as a great invention. That's the software change. Incredibly, it doesn't take enormous amounts of money. What it takes is just doing the right things and inventing the right things. My name is Billy Talley, and I run the engineering and operations here at Stage 2 Innovations. Manoj truly believes in giving back. One of his ways that he believes in giving back is coming up with innovations to help people. Stage 2 is filled with tinkerers, guys that, in their garage, they don't have cars. They have stuff they're building. You should see how I got hired. I had actually built a nail gun powered pogo stick, and they thought I'd fit the job well. And these guys are in heaven. I mean, I think they would work there if I didn't pay them. All right, cool. When Billy first came to us, I said, Billy, whatever you want to buy, go buy it. I think he was in shock because you never tell a guy who likes tools he can buy whatever tools he wants. Uh, we have a very, very uh, well-equipped shop here. There's not much we can't build ourselves. Manoj has expressed many times, if it doesn't make a big difference, find something else to do. Life is too short to, to spend it doing things that don't have a real impact. We're here to make a difference. If you want to do something for the poor half of the world, be here. 
If it doesn't make us money, but it really changes the lives of people, we're still going to do it. We have the wherewithal to make it a usable product so that people throughout the world can use it. We strive to be fast to failure. We're going to take something and we're going to run as fast as we can and do what we have to do so we can determine whether we're going to go forward or we're not. These are items that we want to bring out on a large scale that he truly believes in. In order to make this, if we didn't have this shop, it'd be weeks out. Now, these guys can program it and make it probably in a day. That part is really, really important. We just concentrate on those things that are going to be incredibly useful. And if you come up with something cool that's not, we don't do it. I have no interest. I don't want to be cool. I actually, I'm never going to be cool. <laughs> so <laughs> that, 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 that's long gone. My job, I think, is to make complex simple, whereas it seems the consul consultant's job is to make simple complicated. Uh, we, we use some experts and consultants sometime, and usually when a science guy says it can't be done, to me that's validation that it can. Uh, so it, it, it's a different, because you, you, you mean we define stuff, like expert. What's an expert? Expert is something, someone who knows everything that was. He's really good at what was. And if you ask him about what will be, he says, no, no, that can't be done, because I'm an expert on what was. Well, wh why do I need you? Because if I wanted to do what was, I don't have a business. So, you know, we, we look at, we do talk to experts just to make sure that maybe they've thought of something or the history of the, that area is something that we haven't thought of. But we really don't rely on them for the future because that's just silly. To me, the largest area of work for the future, energy and water are the real solutions to health, livelihood, all of the stuff that goes above it. Most people don't realize in, in rich countries, but half the world either has no electricity or electricity two, three hours a day. Everything requires energy. So you try to look for that which is the one thing that will lead to benefits that are across hundreds of things. So human mechanical energy is so amazing. Why can't we use that to create energy? So we've invented a hybrid bicycle that you pedal for an hour and you have electricity for 24 hours. We call it free electric. The free electric, I think, is the coolest of all our inventions. Not just because it just looks really great, but it's so simple. It's sort of what we try to do is make things simpler and simpler. And yet it's gonna affect, maybe have the largest effect of anything in the last hundred years. The reason is, for the poor half of the world, they have, have electricity 24-7. Electricity is the greatest en enabler there is. And we've kept half the world out of it. This enables all of these people who have not been part of the Industrial Revolution they're still living as if it's 2,000 years ago. All of these people now can become part of a productive society. And this is what will enable them. This solves the problem no matter what happens, whether it's sun shines or cloudy or night or whatever it is, anything happens, you have electricity. You're never out of electricity. Also, if you look at worldwide, the other side is really interesting. Hurricane Katrina was a Category 5 monster that became the costliest disaster ever in the U.S. If a disaster happens, if Katrina hits or some big storm hits, and we've all been through where you had no electricity, the one thing you don't want, you want your cell phone to be always available. You don't want to be out of touch. And you don't want to be in the dark. The worst is being without a cell phone and in the dark. <laughs> so you're alone in the dark. With this, it can never happen. What people normally do is they'll get a generator, diesel generator. But the problem with the diesel generator is when disaster hits, there's no diesel available. You have this, you will never run out of electricity. And you never generate any pollution. So half the world is not going to generate pollution in their homes. So if you pump for an hour, you're keeping maybe a pound of CO2 out of the air. Right now, we're pumping about 
25 billion pounds of matter up in the air every year. And you figure sometime that's gonna make a difference every year. So what this does is you have electricity for all these people and it's mechanical. You work for an hour, you have electricity for 24 hours. The only side effect is you get stronger and healthier. There is no other side effect to that. That's the ideal invention. That's why simple stuff is the greatest because it impacts everything and it doesn't have unintended consequences. There really is only a, a few components. You have the basic frame, you have the bicycle gearing, uh, you have the flywheel, you have the battery, and the generator. So it's, it's very, very simple. You know, there's not a whole lot to it, and it's just like riding a bicycle. You know, right. after you get going, Let's see if I can it's do pretty it. simple. Okay. So this is this the right gear for yeah. starting? Yeah, well, that, you're, you're in second gear, actually, so you're a little bit tall. So it's like driving your car away in second gear. Well, actually, I can see you there. That's a better, you lean back. Yes, that's the whole part about the reclining well, side. That's pretty cool. With human energy and working out a lot of the efficiencies, we're able to go and power 1,050 equivalent watts of lighting and energy power. That's like being able to, to power 10 100 watt light bulbs. I mean, it's a lot of light. Wow. So when, when does this start to get to a point where it lights up everything. Well, actually, right about now. Be any time now. There you there go. There we go. All right. Is that from me? Yeah. Just doing it here? Yep. Actually, this isn't bad. This is No, it's not bad at all. This is like where you would set a bike if you were going to exercise? Yep. And with that, you're still able to charge your cell phone, you're able to uh, charge your tablet, um, you run a small fan, you know, it really kind of puts some of these things into perspective. Pedal for an hour and you can have lights, charge your phone and everything else throughout the night. This is the cheapest, most practical way of getting electricity throughout the world. No matter where remote location you are, so now all of a sudden all this whole economy of the, all of these poor that were not contributing anything to their outside world, now they're all bringing it up. All of a sudden they're on the internet. You know, they're getting information on, on uh, all of a sudden they're getting educated. So the, the real thing is to get the, the poor out of their poverty. And one of the basics is energy. I mean, think about it. The poor half stay the poor half because they have no power. They have no energy. That's one of the most fundamental things. That and water, those are the two biggest things that poor person really needs. Somebody asked me, you know, in the interview, I said, what, what does an entrepreneur really need? So I said, they only need two things, common sense and a sense of urgency. That's it. And they asked me, who, the, who should we learn this stuff for? And my answer was, from your mom. Because she's probably done more management than your MBA professor. You know. Because she's got a budget, you got all these kids running around, hard to manage. All of this thing has to be done every day, seven days a week. Now that's work. That's hard work. That's learning on the job. No matter where somebody stands on global warming or that whole issue, pollution is a problem. I don't care who you are or what your scientific uh, belief system is. We know that that's bad. We need to get rid of it. Is there a way to get totally clean energy that's sort of bullseye of all answers with no pollution and unlimited energy? So our first question was, where's the energy? And there's only one answer. And that's right here. A few miles underneath us is unlimited power, unlimited energy. You know, a few miles down, the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. You take that energy and you bring it up. Unlimited, pollution-free. Is there a way to bring up just the energy, just the heat? 
You can't use copper wire because it'll melt. So we found this material called graphene. Graphene is a substance that is really made out of graphite, which is like pencil lead. Right? And what they discovered was that if they take one molecule layer at a time off this graphite, that's called graphene, okay? And it has incredible properties. It's 100 times better conductor than copper. It's lighter than air, stronger than steel. It transfers heat really efficiently. If you put 100 degrees here, you get 100 on the other side instantly, and the middle is completely cool. So the heat that you put in gets all the way there. Whether you go 10 feet or you go miles, you could bring up unlimited energy from deep underground to the surface, pollution-free. And so I approached the graphene guys and I said, could you make me a string? And they looked at me like, why would we make a string? You know, I said, look, a string is the most rudimentary technology, right? If you have a string of something, you can make cloth, you can make walls, you can make rope, you can make a cable. So if you make me a string, I'll put those strings together and make a cable. Then I'll put the cable underneath the ground. And that cable will bring up the heat. And so at first they were a little wary because it seemed too simple. They have already made the first set of ropes for us, the short ones. They've tested it and found it to work perfectly fine. We are using that and working at Stage 2 in Michigan. Stage 2 has a platform we are building where we'll test everything out and then that product will be commercially manufactured and propagated from Singapore. This would be the greatest invention maybe ever because if you can get unlimited energy from underneath the earth, pollution free, that's everything, that's everything. You have no pollution, you have no fossil fuel issues, you have no um, you know, CO2 coming out, uh, greenhouse gases, you know, none of that. All of that is gone. Here's the answer. Yet no money, no research, no resources are being put to this. So this is a sort of a, a teaser to say, look guys, in your country you want energy security? Do this. You have unlimited energy without having to import anything. Now some countries are not going to like this very much because those who export, you know, fossil fuels are going to be pretty upset with me. Um, but I've kind of transferred all this technology, all of our thoughts to Singapore so that there's a, there's a, a place that's, that's neutral that is then going to give it to the rest of the world. And so this is to encourage people to say, look, if you want energy security, put resources in this. Energy is the great equalizer. If energy was plentiful, the poor wouldn't be poor. Our concern here isn't to make people rich. Our concern is, can we get them to make a livelihood? Can we get them to be healthy? Can we get them clean water? If you can get it to that level for the people that don't have it, that's an enormous benefit. Wall Street fellows are so enamored of companies that spend 5% of their sales on research versus 3%. What, is this brains by the pound? You know, it, it, it's, it's not about the money. Good stuff doesn't come from money. And history tells us that, and we still chase it. Mobs of PhDs do not come up with great inventions. It's a couple of guys in a garage that have proven that that's not true. And it's usually a couple of people. Throughout history, it's only been a couple of people have come out with the greatest of stuff. And yet we insist that if we have 1,000 PhDs instead of 500, we're going to do it better. It makes no sense. The drought has left its mark here. Some communities could soon run out of water entirely. This is what the Sierra looked like a year ago. But this winter, what a difference. The state now in extreme drought. Nature's always smarter than we are. 
Let's say you come up with an invention that makes clean water out of all this huge amounts of salt water that the world has. Water everywhere, not a drop to drink. So we've got all this water, but we can't use it. Now there's a lot of places around the world, whether it's India, Africa, China, everywhere, there's a shortage of water. And one of the reasons we went after water is because it is totally fundamental to human life. Ray bars are holding, starting to make distillate. Cool. Where we are right now is the rain project. This equipment, what it does, it turns seawater or any dirty water into fresh water. Well, one of the reasons why we got involved in the rain project is we saw a lot of lacking technologies in the market to generate what we call high quality water which can be used for agriculture, drinking, and industrial applications. But more importantly, it does not require any operational support. All right, start spinning other parts. The reason we called it the RAIN project basically mimics nature. It heats water, you have water vapor, and then you take that moisture into a different compartment, and then you distill it. The steam, or vapor, turns into water. So it takes energy to heat the water, and then the energy is released when you turn it back to water. So we take that energy and recycle it back to heating the water again. This little bitty machine here can do 1,000 gallons an hour. Some of the great things about it compared to what the technology is today is one, it has no parts that go are consumables. No screens or no membranes that go bad. And it can be made to make distilled water or any level of clean water. Whereas current technology will only take seawater and turn it into drinking water, but it will not turn it into water that can be used for agriculture. It still has too much salt. This was our, our, our prototype version from six months ago. We learned off this version. We added some new ideas and concepts and we built to what we believe is our next version to go into the field for commercial use. Billy came out of automotive, so everything is made with that discipline in mind, that you're gonna build a plant, and then you're gonna have pop hundreds of these out every day. As we call it, we can cookie cutter it. So we can stamp out thousands upon thousands of them. The world's requirements are staggering. So you need to be able to build thousands of these, you know, instead of one plant that takes 15 years to build. We don't have the time for that. We're able to take, you know, seawater, undrinkable, unusable for anything, and turn it into, into complete drinking water, literally in a, in a matter of minutes. And the beauty is, it's a very self-contained system. You don't need a lot of infrastructure to do it. If you move something in in a modular basis, you need the hoses to hook up for the water, a couple of tanks to collect the water, and electricity to run it. So it's very easy um, and, and modular system to be able to put in anywhere in the world. And when you're done, you have lovely, fresh, clean water. It's warm enough to make tea right now, but good, fresh, ready to go. Great. How is it? It's good. It's good distilled water, you know, it's, it's uh, this, this water right here is probably at a level um, almost to pharmaceutical grade water. Wow. And uh, that's one of the other beauties is we can raise or lower what, you know, how, what the level we want to. But this is very, very, very pure water right now. From fresh, clean water comes food, comes livelihood for farmers, comes health. This is the first time exceptional drought has ever been declared in California. These before and after pictures show where water levels should be and where they are today. Whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. If you don't have water, you have to move or die. That's going to happen across the world. We have to work on water. There's no choice. So in California, I mean, right now they're not looking at it. Nobody wants to say it. But if you don't get water, if you don't solve this problem, California becomes a desert. Now we're looking at it and saying, 
instead of one big desalination piece of equipment, you have a farm of these. It can either be put on the shore next to the ocean, or you create this barge which has a lot of units on it. So a barge can maybe produce somewhere between 15 and 20 million gallons a day. Right? And why, the question would be, why, why on a barge? Well, the simple answer is that's where the water is. You know, so let's say you put it a couple miles offshore, you have this barge which has a short height because the equipment is underneath. And the reason it's underneath uh, is because the water will just flow into it. And so you don't have to pump water in. So it flows in, doesn't kill the wildlife. You can then pipe the fresh water either on floating pipes uh, to the land, or you can put it in tankers and, and bring it to land. So we're thinking of things like if you, if you had 100 or 200 barges, let's say in, off Southern California's coast, you could, all the shortfall of Southern California would be covered. And the advantage of that is that if people at that point say, well, you know, we don't like you being there, then you say, okay, see ya, we'll go to the next place. So there's some, the answers have to be uh, lower in energy, then it ha needs to be, be able to be made in massive scale, and then it also has to be, go past political issues. All of those are real problems. And so this project, what it does is say, okay, we, with this, if you have thousands of barges throughout the world, we can address the, the needs of you know, ridiculous amounts of people. And in the end, we're gonna have to do that in order to, to, to take care of the seven, eight, nine billion people that are gonna end up on Earth. So, so that's, that's a project that's for us is a big deal. We have uh, what's called the Prime Directive, which is if any of you have ever seen Star Trek, there's a Prime Directive. And the Prime Directive in our company is no aggravation. Okay. Nobody gets to give us aggravation, whether it's customers, vendors, employees. If you aggravate, you gotta go. <laughs> it's that simple. Because, and it's really business, because usually it's the 1%, you know, some customer that's got 1% of your business, and he's driving you nuts. And he's taking up 80% of your head. How is that business? So aggravation is the largest cost in business. My work is my hobby. I don't really do work because I have to. I actually like it. It's my basketball and football. So much fun. I just tried four different new flavors of Five Hour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can go from one, you know, all of a sudden doing charity to do, doing technical to doing five-hour flavor. I have to switch from company to company within minutes. <laughs> I don't think he would be Manoj if he wasn't doing a lot of things at, a, at one time. It's how he thrives. I want a Jetson suitcase. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, good luck with that. We could do that. We could do that. Okay. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> Which way? I always get lost here. Too many companies. I forgot my keys. <sighs> so annoying. And then the uh, well, dance. More well, fancy. Yeah. And we have oh, to tell wow. you a joke about Capella, but we'll let you know. This is specially for you. Oh, God. <laughs> this is just to annoy me. <laughs> this is to give me aggravation. <laughs> Let me give you a quick 50 cent tour and then okay. you can see. Yeah. So this is uh, about three times the size we had. Okay. The cutting edge of medical science today is changed from what they've been doing for the last 50 years. For the last 50 years, what they've been doing is saying, okay, here's a disease, let's kill it. You know, let's kill something. And now, what they're looking at is, well, no, 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 that's really not the answer. The answer is what is known as immunotherapy. In other words, the, in cancer right now, the biggest thing that everybody's working on is immunotherapy. What the ultimate goal is, is to make somebody stronger internally and so that disease doesn't happen or that the disease becomes so small because it's getting attacked by the immune system. What we found for that is one of the great products that have been in, that's been invented 
you know, decades ago. So when it was invented, it wasn't the right time for it. Now, when people are looking at immunotherapy as the big thing, this is probably the biggest weapon in its arsenal. Uh, does yeah, it is. Foam? Same memory foam. Yeah. yeah. Only the color is uh, different. Uh, Slightly, like, yeah. yeah. And everything else is the same. Right here, we're working on the ECP project called RENEW. And the ECP project stands for External Counter Pulsation. The idea is the ECP squeezes blood from the legs back into the core body and assists the heart when the heart's resting. While the heart is resting, this is pumping. While the heart is pumping, this is resting. They go back and forth, so it acts almost like an auxiliary heart. The arteries become wider, which lets blood pass more easily. The effects happen through the entire body. The evidence is overwhelming that it makes people healthier. Right, tighten that, then tighten that. Right, there you go. Was that easier? Yes. When I first looked at it, I said, are you guys kidding? I mean, is this Monty Python? Yeah, this one and this one. There's an old movie called uh, Life of Brian, uh, people are volunteering for crucifixion. If somebody asked me, okay, you've got heart problems, which would you like, surgery or not surgery? Well, first, I'd like to try the non-surgery, guys. I mean, I don't have to be a genius to figure that part out. Even if it doesn't work as well, you know, you would still want to say, I want to go with the non-surgical approach. We looked at that and we thought, okay, this is pretty obvious. And then we realized that there were so many things it was doing. And amazingly, the science guys, over the years, there were 300 published peer-reviewed studies on the benefits of this. And yet, it never made it into the mainstream. Well, when first somebody came to me with it, I said, look, I, you know, there's so much logic here. I'm just going to buy one. So there were couple of guys that were making it. Uh, now, because nobody really bought many of these, it was a big clunker. It took up half the room, and it was 220, created heat. It was terrible, right? I said, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm going to buy it. So we have one here all folded up. You put it together? So we will go and, and pop That's it That's a good idea. Right just... OK. I should time this. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we changed the whole thing, so made it really simple, small, made a bunch of modifications to it. We've talked to some of the top guys in the world in terms of both cardiologists as well as medical research guys, and they're all, of course, this is great. However, we asked some people that are not at the top of the field, and they said, no, 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 no. This is for old people that can't have surgery. Surgery is way better. And it's not because they're being dishonest. It's because how everybody's been trained. It's legacy. It's how I was taught. Put the hoses on and it's ready to run. OK. Well, that was about a, <laughs> less than a minute. OK. So actually, this can be now put in a corner somewhere or taken in a truck or Put it in a closet, put it in a corner. You can store it away okay. or. Very cool. You know, it can go room to room for people. You right. know it. Right. You in know, a doctor's it, office or something. And it plugs into a normal 110 volt plug. What it does is it enhances circulation. Nature has already made this pump called the heart, and it's pumping to keep everything going, you know, getting oxygen and nutrients, hauling in the waste. Then what happens over time is the pump gets old. The pump gets old, doesn't quite do the job. All of a sudden, you've got all kinds of things happening from, you know, from your toes to your hair, you know, skin's wrinkling, arthritis, all of these things happen. Where they come from? Really, where they came from is that you got weaker. Your system got weaker. That's when you let all of this junk in. Think about it. If you leave waste, if you leave trash all over the body, if you leave trash in your head, and then you get a disease in your head, and you're thinking, well, how, how did I get disease? Well, you left trash in your head, right? It's what trash happens, it rots turns to poison, and all of a sudden you have diseases. If you haul away the trash, the chances are being better, being healthier, and not having those diseases come in are much higher. So what this does 
is enhances circulation. And again, back to what we do here at stage two, it's just nature with a twist. We go for simple, which is, if you're healthier, if you're better, if you're stronger, then there's less disease. I got this from Sir David Lane, and I was thinking all about nutrients and oxygen. And he pointed out, no, 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 it hauls away the waste. And he put it so well, which was, the idea is not to treat illness, it's to treat wellness. It's to make wellness better. That's how you treat illness. That was, that was so smart. David Lane is uh, regarded as one of the foremost scientists and experts in the area of cancer and oncology. He's actually been knighted by the Queen. He's a brilliant person. Uh, when you get to talk to him, you'll realize how fast he can understand the things we are doing. And he sees tremendous benefits for ECP in healthcare. So his point is, if you can delay ailments, that's healthcare. We tend to think of ourselves as being well or being ill, but the reality is it's a continuum. And what we should be aiming for is great wellness and no illness. I think what we tend to do is think we're well until we're ill, and, and that's the wrong way around. We need to be thinking about maintaining health as a much more proactive process. Everybody wants a shortcut, so maybe I take this vitamin and I'll be better, or maybe I'll do this, I'll be better. But what we need to do is think about fundamentals. So what is the fundamental? The fundamental is the blood, the circulation. That's what your heart's doing, that's what's taking nutrients around your body, that's what's critical for eliminating waste products. So clearly, poor circulation is the basis of a, of a lot of illness. So it's clear to me, you know, that anything that can help people to, uh, to improve their health is very, very important. So ECP is an example of that. Everybody says, well, you know, how can something so simple work? How can just pumping your circulation a bit help? But the question is, ask the question, does it work? If it does work, then it's very valuable. And I think this is where, you know, you have to go outside the system. I mean, the current system educates people to behave in a certain way. You know, you, you, you get ill, you go to the doctor, the doctor's a godlike figure, the doctor's going to save you, you know, that's how it works. And, and instead of thinking, oh, I'm part of this process, you know, I can't be passive, I should be active. And I think it's that shift in thinking to think about new ways of doing things. Of course, it doesn't solve every disease there is, but it is one of the greatest things that we found. This is the answer for the poor. Of course, you know, whether you're poor or rich, you're still only a human being. Health is something that's across the board, whether you're rich or poor. When we looked at that for, for, for the poor, we said, okay, well, this, this is across all human uh, needs. And if you can do this, how many things does it affect? Is it wide enough? Oh, yeah. Because now we made it for whatever. So, yeah, we still did it for 95th yeah, it's, it's, percentile. Yeah, it's so. still... So if I gain another 20 pounds, <laughs> I'm still okay. The interesting part is that once you try it a couple of times, you're like, okay, okay, I need that. You just feel better. You are better and you feel better. Uh, I mean, I've been on it for a couple, three years now. And my son says, you know, in 30 years, I'll be 50 and you'll be 40. <laughs> so so the, the effects have been remarkable. And so I said, okay, if I'm gonna use it, then I need to get that benefit out to everyone. And uh, we're gonna impact health in a way that no medicine can do it. We have our own jargon to some extent. Like for example, somebody comes to me the project or a product that we're gonna go sell or, or some, some project. I ask them, is it slam dunk? You know, and, and no, it's really good. I said, no, no, is it slam dunk? So, but, but it really, it's a good product. And what it does is it totally clarifies their mind that, oh no, it's not slam dunk. Then, then I say, well, why are we gonna do it? When we first went out to do philanthropy in a, in a big scale, so we started giving money all over the place and helping other people to do their work. As time goes on, you learn stuff. And then you realize, if you help a little bit, it's a good thing, but at my scale, you're just throwing sand in the ocean. 
you know, it just disappears every time you do something. In India, for example, we're building two hospitals in places where they just don't have any medical facilities. So we started this foundation called the Hunts Foundation. We invent stuff here, and then the Hunts Foundation is going to be the one to distribute all of these things which are non-existent there. So as it grows, your responsibility grows, but also the what you affect grows. There's an old story from Indian scriptures about a blind man heading towards a well. There's a guy who's watching. If the blind man falls into the well, who gets the blame? Is it the blind man? Or is it the guy who's watching? Our approach to philanthropy, there has to be meaning. I mean, the question for us was this. How can we make a sizable difference to alleviate human suffering? Who's got the technology for this? Who can make this happen? Manoj is driven by the fact that work is never done. What it shows is that a single person with a small team can actually affect close to five million people. So it doesn't take much to then go and say, how do I help the remaining 500 million? If you're doing really great things that have purpose, you feel great. And so we found a whole bunch of things that we can do ourselves that will make uh, a difference for, you know, for 100 years. The more wealth you get, the bigger your duty becomes which is to help those who have less, who are suffering. The more you're given, the more you're asked. You should be more responsible for the more you're given. It's not a curse, but it's like a weight that if you're given more, more is expected from you. And it should be. It's that simple. That's it. <laughs>